Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and our Aviation Outlook webinar. I'm Alan Stolzer, and I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of the College of Aviation at the Daytona Beach campus. I'm pleased to report that our first eight events have drawn more than 5,000 registrations. Thank you so much for your interest and support of Aviation Outlook. For our ninth webinar in this series, our, it is our pleasure to welcome alumna Kim Becker, President and CEO of the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority. Ms. Becker is responsible for the management and oversight of the County Airport Authority and San Diego International Airport which generates $11.9 billion annually in economic impact for the Southern California region. In 2019, San Diego International, formerly known as Lindbergh Field, welcomed 25 million passengers of which more than 1 million were international passengers. San Diego is the busiest single runway airport in the US and the third busiest single runway airport in the world. Her career in aviation and airport management has also included positions at San Jose Airport, Teterboro, and others. She has served as president of the uh, California Airports Council, representing 33 commercial service airports across the state, and previously served on the board of directors for the Southwest chapter of the American Association of Airport Executives. Ms. Becker holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and a master's of business administration in aviation from Embry-Riddle. Kim, it is with great pleasure I welcome you to Aviation Outlook. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really thrilled to uh, spend some time with you. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, I've really been looking forward to this. Uh, before we learn more about your interesting career, uh, I'd like to get your um, thoughts on the state of the aviation industry. And uh, your airport, like uh, all others, has experienced a significant decline in passengers about 75% year-over-year decline as of July 2020 due to the pandemic. What are your thoughts on the near term and how do you expect airports across the country to do in 2021? Yes, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting time for airports across the country. We have been challenged like we have never been challenged before since March and we are still struggling. Uh, so many people compare to what, what's happening now to what happened in September 11th, because then the, the doors just shut down and everything closed. But we're finding that this is incredibly different because um, in, for September 11th, we were given a roadmap to reopening. And within two or three days, we, we had the ability to reopen. This is completely different because there's just so many unknowns at this point. As you indicated, passengers are down 70% across the country. Um, leisure and rural destinations are doing better. Our numbers here in San Diego um, are about 71.5% down right now. So we've really benefited from being a, a leisure destination. Um, international traffic is, is non-existent at, at San. We have a couple of Mexico flights right now. Um, but I really have a fear for autumn numbers throughout the country uh, in case there is a, another uh, round of uh, a surge of COVID cases. Um, forecasts right now are, are indicating anywhere from a late 23 to all the way to 25 for rebounding. And um, rebounding may not look the same as it does right now. So we're watching closely. Uh, we're working with a lot of unknowns and we are just hoping things turn around for us in the next couple of months. Absolutely, I think we're all hoping the, uh, the same thing um, in, in so many sectors of aviation. So uh, I, I took my first flight uh, since COVID this past weekend mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite different uh, obviously, but let me ask you, uh, how has the airport experience changed 
uh, for the traveling public uh, since the health crisis uh, started? Yeah, it is very different. Travelers are so much more conscientious about health and safety now. And they're going to demand a lot more from airports and airlines as we, we go along. And we've done our best to respond, again, with so many unknowns um, and, and uncertainties. The regulations keep changing as we go along. Uh, but you'll note that the boarding processes have changed. Uh, they, uh, for example, Southwest, they normally build board 30 at a time and you all line up. Now they only allow 10 people to, to line up at a time and everybody boards. And so they try to keep the social distancing. Mm -hmm. In the actual airport terminals, there are, there's very little food and beverage offerings. Uh, we've tried to close down as many venues um, as possible, but still um, allow uh, enough food and beverage so that passengers can uh, grab something before they get on because there's no food or very limited food and beverage on board the flights. Um, they deplane, uh, the airlines deplane a few rows at a time or so they say um, if you're on board, everybody still stands up and does the, the mass scramble for the bags. Um, but they, they give an announcement saying they're only going to do a few rows at a time. A lot of people aren't checking uh, or are checking bags now because they don't want to deal with that mass scramble at the end. Um, we're certainly trying to um, make sure that uh, you know, there's social distancing around the airport. You'll see signage everywhere uh, that reminds you of that. There's lots of plexiglass all over the airport. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of changes we're hoping um, that we can go back to some level of normalcy at some sort of point in the future. But I believe that many of these things will, will carry on even after things change. I'm, I'm curious, just dovetailing on that, Kim, uh, of all the changes that you're seeing uh, occurring at the airports, uh, what do you see us kind of maintaining post-COVID? Uh, what does that look like going forward? I mean, I would imagine some of the protocols will be relaxed, but what do you see us maintaining after this is over, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think we will be back and we will thrive, but I really do believe it will look different. I, I believe that the airlines will be revisiting their strategies for where they fly and the days of competition for the sake of competition and to protect a market share. Um, for example, you know, the Southwest and Alaska battle in Southern California and uh, Southwest and Delta in, in Seattle, things like that. I, I think that the airlines will be more selective about where they're flying. Right now, they're reducing some of their point-to-point -point service in favor of hub operations so that more people can congregate and get onto those flights and, and take the fewer flights out. So I think they're going to be a little bit more strategic. Um, for airports, what I think needs to happen is uh, greater use of technology. Passengers will want more contactless systems uh, and the TSA and CBP have been testing those uh, proce uh, passenger processing systems uh, using more automation, but they've got a little pushback in the, in the past. For example, CBP, their facial recognition. Everybody was concerned with privacy issues. So now they're saying facial recognition is great, so that um, you don't have to have the contact that you would normally have. And it also speeds up processing. Um, TSA, they're trying to put some more automated systems in place. And so I think the industry as a whole will benefit from this. If I try to look at the silver lining in the dark cloud, uh, because this has really prompted people to bring and airports and, and uh, the government to bring new technology in. Um, and, and things go on. You can talk about the ground transportation system, uh, whether or not people will uh, get into to TNCs like Uber or Lyft. Right now, those numbers have dropped tremendously. Nobody wants to get into a car that people have been in and out of several times a day. And our parking numbers are actually up. Transit system numbers are down. Um, and I think they'll rebound, but they'll, they'll look different as well. But it's all the whole package of what happens in and around an airport system. So we have to then adjust to that as we go on. Um, yeah. 
big, big challenges. There are. You know, uh, so prior to COVID, uh, Kim, I know you're, you and your team at the uh, San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, uh, you're doing a great job of leading a, an airport that is growing. Uh, last year marked the sixth straight consecutive year of record-breaking passenger totals at the airport. Uh, I think there were over 25 million passengers uh, that used the airport last year. I'm curious, what sorts of challenges and opportunities uh, are presented to you and your leadership team when the airport is growing at that kind of a pace? Yes, um, it's a significant issue for us, especially um, you mentioned our one runway, but we're also just 661 acres. And we always joke, and when I'm out in the public talking about it, we always say that we never round off to 660 acres because that one acre is so important for this airport. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually fit 50 San Diego International Airports on to Denver International and no 30 more. airports on to, to DFW. Wow. Um, so space is just, uh, just a luxury here. So everything that we do, we have to think about what the long-term implications of either building something in a place or um, modifying an operation because we're living with this congestion pre-COVID on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Terminal 1 was built 53 years ago, ago and it, it was built in 1967. And the passenger volume for max capacity of Terminal 1 was supposed to be 2.5 million passengers going through on an annual basis. And now we have about 12 million going through that terminal. There are, there's no place to sit. Uh, there's no place to plug in your phones. There's very few places to, to eat and, and purchase um, goods. It's not a wonderful customer experience at all. And um, so we're, we're going to be working on that in the future. Um, but the last six years have really taken off and we're thrilled about that. Uh, but we def it definitely brings on challenges, not only in the terminals, but on the airfield as well. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a fair amount of competition among airlines uh, at San Diego Airport. Uh, I believe Southwest is your largest carrier by uh, seat count. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you go about recruiting new airlines uh, to come in or encouraging those uh, who already serve the airport to add additional service? Yeah, so um, for the students that are listening, the best job, in my opinion, at an airport is air service development. You get to go out and explore the world and go visit airline headquarters all over the world and um, try to bring them into your airport. It's a fantastic job and not a lot of people understand that until you get into uh, airport management. What we do um, is an incredible amount of analysis to determine if there is a strong market here in San Diego. We look at leakage uh, to LAX and area, other area airports. We go out to businesses and get their testimony and uh, analyze their trip volume to, to different locations. And what you ha have to understand really is that the competition really isn't just about San Diego and Southern California. It's, it's really about the whole world. The airlines can put that one airplane that they're trying to position anywhere in the world. And um, we wanted to come here and so does every other airport. Uh, but one of the things that I, I remind my board when they're constantly asking me about different services to, to locations that they may want to go to is that we don't want to go out and recruit an airline that won't be successful here because the worst thing you can do is have an airline come in and then three months later, they're not successful and, and leave. And then the rest of the world looks at it, the rest of the industry looks at it and says, well, you can't be successful at San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what we do when we go out there. But then we also offer packeted, packages, incentive packages to bring them in where we lay, waive some fees like landing fees and some of their operating costs. We also provide them marketing funds to help uh, promote the flight once they're here. Hmm. But the bottom line is bringing in any airline is a very long-term process. I call it a marathon, not a sprint. 
uh, it can take many, many years to bring an airline into the airport. Mm -hmm. And you called that, uh, that role as an air service development role. Yeah, uh, that's okay. generally what it's called across the, the industry. Very fascinating. Interesting. Thank you for that. Um, your airport uh, has scheduled service from so-called legacy carriers, uh, as well as the ultra low cost carriers such as uh, uh, Spirit and Frontier. Uh, from an airport manager's perspective, Kim, how do, you, how do the needs vary between those uh, different kinds of, uh, of airlines? Uh, at San Diego, I certainly appreciate the diversity of our airlines. As you indicated, Southwest has the highest market share, but United, American, Alaska, and Delta are equal number twos, so that when they kind of get together and have discussions, the four of them can kind of uh, equalize the, the impact of Southwest. It's very hard to have a dominant carrier at an airport because then they kind of dictate everything that you can do. Um, so, uh, and, and what the general population doesn't understand is that uh, we as an airport can't tell the airlines where to fly. We can't tell uh, which airlines can and come at, cannot operate at the airport, we have to be open to everything. Mm -hmm. So when the low cost carriers come in, they typically are looking for uh, the, the cheapest rates. They want to be put into a corner of the airport that's you know, not necessarily as uh, nice or as, uh, as uh, bright as some of the other areas. Um, and at San Diego, we've put in place what's called equalized rates so that every carrier comes in and they pay the same rates across the board. And a couple reasons that we do that uh, is because number one, we don't have a lot of space that is outside of the terminal area, like across the field in a hangar to put a low cost carrier. And also it reduces our flexibility. We have you know, only so many gates. And if there's differential rates across the airport, you can't uh, share the gates and use a common use system quite as with as much flexibility. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very limited. And ultimately they have the same um, needs. They have the same maintenance needs, the same wear and tear on the buildings and offices. Um, and I really just didn't want that customer experience to be diminished with separate services at different locations. We want the airport to reflect San Diego community as a whole. So that, that's why we don't treat them differently where some other airports might. I was just going to ask you, uh, so is that uncommon? Is, the, is your approach uh, the exception or is it the, is it the norm? Um, well, it, it really varies by airport, but um, it depends on the way you're structured. So some air, airports have um, a different carrier build out a terminal. Um, so they can't have equalized rates, so they have a little bit more opportunity to do, um, you know, put some of the low cost carriers in a different area. Um, it could depend on whether you have uh, multiple terminals, even if they're operated by the airport, um, where one is older and one is newer, or if you have space on a different part of the airport that they can build out their own little terminal or I, th I think one airport even operates a low cost carrier out of a hangar on the opposite side of the field. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the customer experience, I think is important to, to have some level of equality across the board. Okay, very good. Uh, you and our audience may have noticed I'm having some uh, technical issues on my end. Um, I'm understanding that my camera is, uh, is uh, coming on and off. So I'm gonna ask our IT uh, colleague uh, monitoring this to uh, switch us over to, uh, to my other colleague, Daniel Friedenzone, the Associate Dean for the College of Aviation. And uh, he's up and running now, so, uh, and let him, uh, let him sort of continue the uh, discussion so that we don't have the distractions that we're experiencing at the moment. So uh, Nick, if you would do that for us and Daniel pick it up from here, I would certainly appreciate it. Kim, to follow up on the uh, question about airlines, uh, your airport has had a tremendous amount of success uh, adding international service, service to Tokyo, handful of cities in Europe, uh, certainly Canada and Mexico. Um, in order to support 
international service and growth in international service. Uh, the airport opened up a international arrivals facility um, a little bit over two years ago. How has that facility impacted your airport? Yeah, thanks. Um, I have to tell you a story about that facility first. On my first week uh, here, we did a groundbreaking for that, and that was in uh, 2017. It might have been my second or third, but in the very, very early part of my tenure here. And they told me within one year that building would be open and fully operational. And you can't build a building like that in one year and have it open and fully operational. Sure. We were able to pull it off, but I thought, oh my goodness, that's my first huge challenge here at San Diego. And um, it's a fantastic facility. We, um, with the opening of the FIS, it doubled the gate capacity. We now have six international gates and two swing gates, which can be used for international or domestic. And we went from uh, being able to process 300 passengers per hour to being able to process 1,000 passengers per hour in a much better environment. The old FIS was in um, the lower level, it was over two levels, but a dark area of the old terminal, and it just wasn't a great first impression of uh, the United States or, or, or San Diego for people even returning home. Um, and we were able to bring a lot of technology into the facility and we, we do have facial recognition uh, for passengers and it speeds up the processing time. And we are also one of the first airports to implement bags first. So what that means is that when you get off the plane, normally you go right to the customs line and you go through all the processing and then you go get your bags. Um, but we do bags first. So what you see is everyone just running off the plane like you normally do to get first in line. So the, the processing doesn't take quite as long, um, but now they wait until they have to pick up their bags. So what that does for customs and border protection is that um, they're no longer the gatekeeper and the time, they, they're no longer responsible for the time. It's really the airline who is operating that determines how fast people get through. Um, and so it's more in control of the airlines. The airlines like that and customs likes that. Um, but the building is just fantastic, and it's a really, like I said, great first impression for San Diego, and um, the processing time is so much better. That's great. I uh, wanted to ask you about that. Is that something, kind of a trend that you see going forward for other airports when you meet with your colleagues across the country in terms of their desire to expand or add international service and the way you've structured it? Is that something that you're seeing that they're really want to copy San Diego in that way? Well, what I see for us anyway, it was that um, it, it's, it's a competitive situation and the FIS being constrained um, made the carriers take a second thought. And what it really did is made us more competitive. And there's no longer the obstacle of uh, you know, limited space and a poor environment for the processing to overcome when we're out there recruiting uh, international carriers so that we really can sell them on the market instead of just a, a terrible facility. And the economic impact uh, mentioned before for international carriers for the airport alone uh, is $450 million annually for our carriers here. And it can be as, as much as $100 million a year per flight for an airport. So um, there's a benefit to having that international travel as well. Certainly significant. I'd like to kind of pivot a little bit and talk about noise. And one of the noise initiatives that uh, I think your airport has started is called the Fly Quiet Program. Certainly where your airport's located, and I know it stresses the importance about being a good neighbor, about being a good member of the community. Can you share a little bit about that initiative and how it's this, kind of fostered an important partnership between the airport and the airlines that operate out of that airport? Yeah, so um, the Fly Quietly program um, is really important for the community because it's kind of a report card for the airlines. And it is something that at the end of a quarter, we, we look at things like um, curfew, how many, we have a curfew here. 
um, one of nine, I think it's nine airports in the country that have, have a curfew. Uh, many of them are in California, but did they violate the curfew? Um, how many missed approaches do they have? We have waypoints out over um, Point Loma, which is right here to the west of me. And um, how many times did they uh, fly within the waypoints or did they miss the waypoints? Because we've set them up to avoid noise sensitive areas. So they get this score, scorecard on a quarterly basis. Now we put it on hold because of COVID, there's just so many things going on. But that's really an indicator of how well the airline is um, doing in compliance with all of our programs that help to mitigate some of the noise impacts. And if you think about San Diego, I don't know how many people have been to San Diego, but when you're on approach, you are flying over homes and buildings and you're flying literally right downtown. And the departure is very similar. So we are truly a noise impacted um, airport. So that quiet flight program, or flight quiet program is very important. We also do a sound attenuation program. We call it our quieter homes program where we, um, with uh, homes within the 65 um, CNEL, it's California noise equivalency level. Um, it's an average rating of noise um, by certain times of day. And homes within the 65 contour uh, are eligible for this sound attenuation program where we go in and we put in new um, insulation. It could be new doors, new windows. Um, some cases they get new HVAC systems. Um, and we've done about 4,300 homes so far. We've got many more to go. Uh, but it's, it's really important, especially we're a downtown airport, to um, be very focused on how we impact the neighbors. And we do, we admit that openly, and we have to work very hard to try to, to mitigate some of that impact. Prior to arriving at the San Diego Airport, uh, you were working at the Mineta San Jose International Airport as the Director of Aviation, I believe, for about four years. Um, your first position at the airport was as Operations Superintendent. Um, you've alluded to about other positions that are very important, especially with respect to career development. But I'm interested in hearing what was that experience like for you and, and what did it kind of, how did it uh, impact you in terms of uh, starting out in the airport field? Yeah, the, the operations superintendent position was a really fun position. Um, I moved to San Jose because I wanted to get back into a commercial service airport. And I thought it was very important to have the, the broad range of experience and background. And I had been at a GA airport, I had been at a small commercial service airport, but I really wanted that larger commercial service airport. And as a superintendent, that's one of those nice starting jobs where you you still get to get out in the field and do all the fun work of runway inspections and, and being out by the airplanes and, and watching and managing the operations. But at that level, you also get some supervisor experience where you're um, managing people, um, talking to the FAA and um, working with your you know, community and your, your um, chain of command within the airport at higher levels. So it's one of those positions that you really get a, a solid background and um, it really set the stage for me working my way through the organization into greater and greater positions. I, I really enjoyed it there. You also eventually, you know, moved into more senior positions and I'm interested in hearing a little bit about your perspective as you moved into those different positions. Um, what are the type of challenges that anybody uh, that assumes greater responsibility in an airport organization has to deal with, especially one that's growing like San Jose was. Yeah, so uh, the fun part about working at an airport is that every day there's something different. Um, it, it, there's never a boring moment in my entire career of many, many years. There's just not been a boring moment. And you get to, you get to, um, experience many different areas of an airport. You can basically come in and do any job uh, that you can out in the real world at an airport. And um, because of that, you have your ability to, to um, grow in uh, your experience and still stay at the same airport if you don't want to move on. Um, 
as you move up in the industry, you really get more into the political environment and making sure that you have a political pulse on the external environment, the things that uh, ultimately impact your airport from an external perspective. Uh, you get into board relations and no, learning how to manage a board. You get into um, employee training and development, uh, recruitment. And at my level right now, it's making sure you, you have the right structure and you have the right job functions and ultimately the right tools to get the appropriate people with the right background in the jobs. Um, and you're promoting diversity and inclusion. Um, we actually have to look at benefits and uh, as an airport authority, we kind of do it all here at San Diego or San Jose. We were part of a city government. So there, the city created the benefit program and, and some of the um, uh, some of the, the rules and regulations. Um, so each type of airport that you go to might be a little bit different, but you can get into finance. You can get into, as I said, air service before, um, marketing, airline rates and charges and working with the airlines. Um, but as you go up in the organization, if you notice, I didn't say anything about operations because um, as the director up at San Jose and now the CEO down at San Diego, um, it's a privilege and a luxury for me to get out on the airfield as much as I'd like to. And so that's the part you miss. You, you don't get out around the airplanes quite as often as, as you did when you were, you know, just starting out. Sure. Before you were at the San Jose airport, you also had the opportunity to work at the uh, Teterboro airport, which is one of the world's business, busiest business aviation airports. Are there differences in working in, in that type of airport that serves primarily corporate and general aviation versus one that also has scheduled airline service and how did that kind of serve you and impact your career? Yeah, that was my very first real job out of college. And um, it took me about six months to get in the door and I just constantly called and um, sent my resume and called again. And I think they got tired of me bugging them and finally they, they hired me. And I love that job because you can do everything there. The, the beauty about Teterboro Airport is that it was a 130, part 139 airport. So it had all the requirements and regulations that a commercial service airport would. Um, so I learned that at that airport. Um, we also uh, did firefighting. I was a firefighter. Um, and you don't get to do that at, at a larger airport. I was a certified weather observer. Normally the tower operators do that. So we really were able to do it all, and, but I still had the Part 139 experience. And at a smaller uh, or a GA airport like that, you, you really get to know the airport community much better. Uh, so I don't know, it was more of a family atmosphere, even though it was one of the busiest uh, GA airports in the country. Sure. Um, it was in the world. It was still, um, one of those airports where everybody knew each other and uh, you still had all the training that you needed to move on and move up. It was a good place. Sounds like a great experience. Yeah. Dr. Stolzer, um, as Dean in our College of Aviation, uh, one of his areas that he's focused a lot of energy is to increase female enrollments in the College of Aviation. About 43% of the people who work for your airport authority are women and you've had success in attracting females into the profession. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about what the industry needs to do in order to attract uh, more women into the profession and kind of what roles higher education institutions and even high schools and middle schools can play uh, in facilitating that. Yeah, I, I think it has to start at a very young age. And um, I think, you know, if you think when you're um, in elementary or, or even middle school, and someone from a career day comes in and talks about that career, it might not hit you right then, but you know, as you're trying to make your career choices later, you've had that experience to go back to and um, something might have touched your heart or, or touched you in some way that says, oh, I remember that. And so I think getting out there and talking to these young kids um, and making sure they're aware of the career possibilities we have a program here called Take Flight, and uh, we bring students in from uh, high school on some occasions and the first year or two of college. And we talk to them all about 
the jobs that can be done at an airport. And we bring in a panel of employees that come from not only the airport, but from different roles at, at the, on the campus as a whole. And so we have pilots in there sometimes, we have air traffic controllers, we might have even the firefighters. And each person talks about their, their job and you see some of the, the kids' eyes light up. Um, so I think you really have to start early and get out there and talk to these kids and then invite them into your, your airport. Airports have to do that role of seeking out um, students and especially for the female role. Um, I mentioned before the call that when I started out, there were very few women in the industry. I was the only female in the room most times. And that we're very fortunate that that has changed over time. Um, there are about 329 commercial service airports across the country. Um, and there are only less, there are less than 30 women CEOs. So those women CEOs get together on a monthly, every other month at this point um, for phone calls. And we talk about how we can get more women in. We support women and we help to bring them up. Um, we also are there to just support one another. Um, and it's been a really good group. It started well before I became a CEO. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hoping to take that forward, but it's all about that support and um, making sure you get to, to students when they're very, very young. Sure. Yeah. There is a lot of interest and in, quite frankly, uh, research and development dollars being invested in uh, urban air mobility technology or advanced air mobility technology. And I suspect that one day uh, in the not too distant future, uh, people will be getting on uh, one of these fantastic devices and being transported from downtown areas to the airports and vice versa. Um, what do airports in general have to be doing in order to prepare for this technology and kind of to support it and embrace it? That might be here sooner than we think because yeah. um, I think it's Uber on their website said that they have a, a test pilot or you know pilot program for certain cities coming in in 2023 that's right around the corner and um, for airports i think um, it could create uh, this competitive opportunity um, and really offer some of those airports that are in outlying areas that you know may not have as much service and um, it's hard to get to those airports or you know, destinations that you want to go beyond the airport um, and make the airport more attractive because number one, you can avoid all that congestion getting there or you can avoid, you know, um, a ski area getting up the rough mountain roads. It just makes it easier as a, as a whole. Um, we though, as airports are going to have to find a way to evolve to accommodate um, these, this new mode. Our infrastructure will have to change um, and uh, we're, we're looking at that uh, because we really don't know what it looks like. We're envisioning something like a, the top of the parking garage could be converted to um, a landing surface for them. Um, but we do have to look at how air, we're going to evolve our airports. And, and in particular for an airport like San Diego, that's very difficult because we just don't have the space. I mean, you have to make it convenient so that when people um, arrive in one of these um, new modes that they can easily go from there and get into the terminal, right? So it's just an, almost another way of looking at a ground transportation operator, but it's sure. arriving in the air. So it's, it's going to be interesting for all of us, especially those with very small footprints to deal with it. Do these type of issues uh, kind of excite you as the leader of an airport authority in terms of trying to figure out to make it work given just the challenges that um, airport construction and a variety of other issues that you have to deal with kind of come into play? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's one of the most fun parts of the job, um, trying to plan for the future and figuring out, uh, you know, what is this air, airport going to, to look like? And um, thinking more than just a couple years in, in advance, we have to think way out and make sure that we are able to accommodate the traffic, make sure that we can, um, uh, embrace innovation and use that 
innovation to make our environment better so ultimately it makes the, the traveling passenger have a much better experience at the airport. It's challenging, but it's fun. I bet. We're, we're delighted that we have uh, not only our current students, but even some prospective students that are participating in the webinar night. And I have some questions that I think some of them would like some answers to and someone with your experience and wisdom. Um, the first one is generally, many of them may want to follow in your footsteps and just work in the airport industry in general, perhaps have an internship. What, is, what advice might you have for them? You mentioned it right there. An internship is absolutely very important. Um, I did an internship and that's really what got me started because that airport director then um, was the one that kept throwing me um, applications, apply here, apply here, apply here. And he also took the time um, and, and treated me as a student and really taught me. And you'll find that the industry is very welcoming that way. Um, so you have, you really should try to do an in internship. Um, I would suggest that you don't wait for that perfect job, get in the door and, um, you know, you, nobody expects you to stay 15 years in, in any position. Get in the door, learn what you can, and then figure out what's best for you and move on or move up if you can. Um, you know, in preparation, get involved with IIAE, American Air, uh, Association of Airport Executives, or ACI, Airports Council International. They usually have student count, uh, chapters and they usually have programs where they'll bring students to the conferences and, and even some offer scholarships mm -hmm. to get you involved. You'll meet everyone in the industry, in the airport industry at those conferences and get there and make those connections, talk to people. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very complicated industry. Um, you really need to make sure that you have a wide range of knowledge. So um, as you start to, as you get in the door and you start to see career progression, um, take any job that comes up for you. Um, if, if you see an area that you're, maybe you don't have the skill set for fully, ask if you can work in that area for a while um, and try to learn on your own and do anything that's asked of you. You know, as you're coming out of college and I know, you know, hey, I wanted to, to do the important things and, and do the things that were, were challenging. But sometimes what I had to do was data entry or, you know, go wash a fire truck. Whatever is needed, you do it and you do it with your whole heart and dedicate your whole self. And then you'll be looked at as things come up. Hey, that person does a really good job. So put your heart into it and um, really um, work for that promotion and work to get in that door. Certainly a lot of good advice there. Are there things that or courses that might be of additional value to students or things that they certainly should take that might make them a little bit more marketable as they seek out internships or their first job out of college that you would recommend? Yeah, um, in college, I, I think, you know, we all focus on the aviation part of it. But if you're going into the airport side, um, you need that as a baseline. And so for me, I went, my undergraduate was for business administration, really because I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. That served me so well now, and I would have known, never known it then. And then when I got, uh, I started flying and kind of got the airport bug, um, that's why I went to Embry-Riddle for my master's so that I could complete my package. But when you're in college, I think you have to take things like speech classes because you're going to be presenting, you're going to be in front of a lot of people many, many times in your career. Negotiating skills, um, they're, especially when you're in the finance area or in my role, you're always negotiating one, one thing or another. And the big thing that we do every year is um, the airport, op not every year, but every couple of years, the airport operating and lease agreement. That's where um, we uh, negotiate the agreements with the airlines that operate here that sets their rates and charges. And we just did that 
last year, um, and it's a 10-year agreement, and that is a very difficult thing to do. You need to take coursework in government affairs and how to learn to operate in your local government and the federal government. Um, environmental is critically important for uh, an airport job. Um, and then the basics, don't forget uh, when you are interviewing, you know, dress the part, step up on your lingo. Um, we get very casual in our conversation and you have to remember to step it up a bit and go in there again, like you want that job um, and you'll do fine. We've had some interesting questions submitted and we'll try to get to a few of those right now. Um, one is about project management perspective. Your airport obviously has uh, undertaken successful uh, additions to the facility. What tools do you and your colleagues use to ensure successful outcomes of those project and operations uh, to make sure that you go according to plan? Yeah, that's a, a really important part because um, we were teasing earlier that uh, the definition of a runway is, uh, or an airport is a uh, construction site with a runway. The airport is always under construction, whether it's huge programs or smaller um, uh, year after year capital programs that we do. So project management is really critical in terms of making sure you have a plan from very early on, from financing all the way, the three things, um, the, the, the budget, the scope and the schedule. You can, you can modify one of those things in order to make a change in the program. Um, but you have to, if you need to go a different direction, you have to modify one of those three things, scope, schedule, um, budget. And so um, you really need to get those skills of project management along the way. And there are, we have some really skilled people in that area and they have kept us out of trouble. The, the community watches for your project to be on time and under budget. That's, that's key. Um, and you really have to make sure that you have a plan in place that tracks the budget, that tracks the schedule, um, that considers uh, change orders and things that have to be uh, modified along the way. There's going to be something that you, you couldn't have projected. Um, you open up a wall and there's some, something behind there that you weren't aware of. I mean, you have to be able to pivot from there. Um, and it takes somebody that has those project management skills to keep everybody else in line, uh, especially when it comes to setting scope. You have a project and all of a sudden somebody says, well, if you're doing that, why don't you throw in this into it? And you've got to have somebody that has those skills to keep everybody in line and keep the scope, schedule, and budget all aligned so that you deliver a successful project. I wanted to hear your thoughts on kind of technology that's slowly becoming part of our society, of the world, basically. Artificial intelligence, autonomy, uh, machine learning, things like that. Is that are those uh, concepts, things that you and your colleagues think about in terms of incorporating into the airport or airport experience for passengers? We do. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we've started here at San Diego is an innovation lab. And um, we feel that we have to stay a step ahead. I mean, it's hard to do in a very uh, regulated environment and a very bureaucratic environment um, where the government, um, you know, either the local or federal um, has a lot of, there's a lot of regulations that surround us. So our innovation lab, what we try to do is take a problem at the airport and bring in people from the outside that have innovative solutions that might uh, solve the problem. And, and right lately, we have been defining the project um, or the problem. At first, when the innovation lab started up, we just go out there and say, hey, you know, do you have an idea that you want to come in and share with us and we'll allow you to test it in a real airport environment. And so, um, We've had some successful successes along the way. I don't know if uh, those of you that are listening have ever tried At Your Gate. At Your Gate is a basically a food delivery service within the airport that if you're on board the flight and you don't have a, a long connecting time, you can have somebody literally bring food to you as you're deplaning and take it with you um, to the next flight. 
Um, and that is now, it started at San Diego and it is now in, I think, 15 airports across the country. And the nice part for San Diego is we get a little piece of the action for every airport that it goes into. Um, and that's a simple example, but um, really, especially with COVID, innovation and um, uh, some of the, the touchless and automated systems are going to be more and more important as we go forward. We have a few minutes left. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on, you know, during these times of uh, challenges for the aviation industry, for airports, certainly for the airlines, it also requires uh, some creativity in terms of finding solutions that work for this time. And also, uh, I think airlines and airports realize they really need each other and always have, even though maybe during the good times, it doesn't, they're not always on the exact same page. Can you talk about some of those things and you know how uh, the airlines and the airports are working together uh, to get through this? Yeah, you know, right now I, I have to be honest that um, it's really about survival mode. And um, we are, uh, the conversations with the airlines right now are for airports are, when are you bringing your flights back? And um, their, their response is when the people come back. And I mentioned in the beginning, there are so many unknowns um, that it really makes it difficult to see. Right now, we only have, we typically have eyes at least six to eight months in ahead. And we, we always tease that that's not far enough, um, but that's the way the airline cycle works. Right now, we have eyes through October. That's it. We have no idea. So um, certainly, we worked with them very closely on all of the health and safety measures at the airport and figuring out how to configure gate spaces uh, and how to configure just the whole movement of passengers through the facility uh, for health and safety purposes. Then we kind of elevated from there and started looking at HVAC systems and you know just the, the actual infrastructure and how that would work. I think the bigger part for us here at San Diego is that we have the opportunity to um, do a wonderful th project, $3 billion project, to replace our aging Terminal 1 facility that I mentioned before. And with that, we are right now just in the early stages of design, and the airlines are at the table. And I think that's very, very important because they have to operate in the facility that we build. Ultimately, ultimately they pay for it. And so having them at the table to address not only, you know, the traditional issues that you're dealing with when you're building a new facility, but how uh, the impacts of COVID and what that looks like. We're also bringing the concession program uh, folks in early so that we know how to manage the concession program. I think that's where we'll see some of the biggest challenges because people don't want that that face-to-face -face personal contact and how what does that look like in a new new facility so um it's a really good time for us to look at those things as we go forward at the at our airport kim i can't thank you enough for joining us tonight this was an extremely informative event uh i know i learned a lot about the airport industry and i suspect those who participated or attended this webinar did as well um, thank you again and wish you and your colleagues and really the airport community all the best uh, going forward. And we hope to see you on campus at some point soon. I'd love to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, October 7th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This will be a very special homecoming edition of Aviation Outlook. Uh, we encourage you to join us. We'll be joined by uh, four graduates who are doing fantastic things in industry and also serve on an important DOT panel. On behalf of Dr. Alan Stolzer, Dean of the College of Aviation, I'm Daniel Friedenzone. Have a good night.